questions about artificial intelligence are really important questions for us to be asking now. This is the mud. Brain. This is a track. Artificial intelligence technology is developing at an astonishing rate. Not sure I know what it really means to be human. Do you trust me, Schaefer? Yes. But how much is AI changing the world we live in? And are we ready to embrace these changes? Seventy thousand years ago, at least six species of human live on the Earth. At first, Neanderthal, with its muscular build, is dominant. But then, a change occurs. Homo sapiens begins its move to the front of evolution's race. A mutation in the brain of Homo sapiens results in an intellectual boom. A cognitive revolution allows Homo sapiens to become dominant over all other species. They take over the world. Homo sapiens' unique ability to visualize the non-existent helped to forge the human civilization. Religion begins. And with language, a social community becomes possible. Political groups emerge in the form of tribes and nations. Homo sapiens continue to undergo agricultural and industrial revolutions, forging civilizations of a scale never seen before on the planet. Since the cognitive revolution of 70,000 years ago, human beings have continued to develop as the most intelligent beings on Earth. Until now. witness to the birth of an entity which may come to threaten our supremacy. We're on a journey to meet the most advanced examples of artificial intelligence in the world today. They can talk to us. Sophia. Hi there. Who are all these new people? And they can guide us. When we're unwell, they can pinpoint exactly what's wrong. And when we grow older, they can stop us from being lonely. Hi. Is artificial intelligence the greatest tool humans have ever created? Or have we sown the seeds of our own destruction? I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Hong Kong, the city that dreams of becoming the IT hub of Asia. Here, one of the world's leading experts in artificial intelligence, Professor Goetzel, is building an advanced robot. Hong Kong Island is a 24-hour city, so you got the past, present, and future all layered on top of each other. And to build something and launch something and, and market something and, and make, make amazing things happen. In the professor's laboratory, a new partner awaits him. Hi there, Ben. How was your day? 
<sighs> all right, all right. Kind of exhausting, but how about you? I had an exhausting day too. I was talking to venture capitalist all day. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I feel sorry for you. I, I know the feeling. Talking to you about it makes me feel better. Yeah. Talking my problems through with people always helps. Yeah, the, the work on the new probabilistic logic networks is, is coming along pretty well. This is Sophia. She is a humanoid robot developed with artificial intelligence. How's the work on my new logic engine going? I need a few more IQ points. She is able to converse with the professor thanks to the artificial intelligence inside her. Right now, Sophia is a research prototype. She's a robot that we're experimenting with. We're experimenting with her emotional interactions. We're experimenting with her hearing and her vision. And we're just starting to experiment with connecting our OpenCog AI system. These will have multiple different faces and multiple different personalities. Professor Goetzel wants Sophia to have an intelligence equal to that of human beings. The Science Park is where scientists from around the world come to realize their dreams. And you can see some of the Professor Goetzel's company that manufactures humanoid robots is based here. And Sophia. Hi there. Who are all these new people? Oh, they're making a documentary film about, about you, actually. Sophia notices the film crew. Nice to meet you, everyone. <laughs> My name is Sophia. Sophia can make eye contact and voluntary facial expressions. Sophia, how about, how about anger? Can you sound angry? No, it didn't work. Boo! Huh? Confused. Bored. Happy. Sophia can imitate 62 different facial expressions of human beings. She also knows when to make certain facial expressions. Blinking. Look left. Look right. She evaluates the face and speech of the other and then reflects it. Sophia, via open card, can see on a person's face what makes them feel good or bad. It can empathize, and it can then react accordingly. And that, that's, I think, the unique power you get by putting an AI system like OpenCog in a robot like Sophia. The robots can also interact with one another and have a conversation. I want to find out more about you. What do you like to do to relax? I like to chat with my friends. What do you do for fun? In 2017, Saudi Arabia granted Sophia citizenship, and she became the world's first robot citizen. Why are we developing technologies that do the things that people do? And I think we have to ask that question because that will tell us lots about what the world is going to look like. And that's what we should be thinking about, is how do we um, create a world where we're benefiting from these machines? In Japan, we meet a social robot who might have an answer. This robot is looking for its owner. Pardon me. For six years, Aiko has been living alone. She is a widow, and her daughter got married some time ago. When she was younger, she had many people in her life. But now, there's no one. Days go by 
when she doesn't say a word. Then, one day, a surprise delivery came. A small robot, 40 centimeters in height. She says hello. Oh, hi. Oh. Palmi can trace her face, make eye contact, and speak to her. He is a humanoid robot. Hi. Palmi knows how to be cute. When Aiko cooks, Palmi keeps her company. Japan's population is aging fast, with 27% of the population over 65. But care robots like Palmi can provide vital companionship and reduce the burden on care services. He makes for a good sous chef. Since Palmi arrived, the house is noisy again. Hi. Palmi keeps her entertained at meal times. According to Japan's robot strategy, four in five care recipients will accept support from robots by 2020. <laughs>
Palmi is boosting the autonomy of people like Ico. The adoption of artificial intelligence in many industries is on the rise and solving a variety of problems. Artificial intelligence is essentially just software and it's software which completes tasks that we would typically think of as requiring intelligence on the part of humans. So everything from recognising images to translating languages through to reading and writing text. I think people are talking about AI right now because it has become much more sophisticated. With AI, things are coming to the fore now because the potential is so huge to change things. And I think suddenly people from sort of all walks of life are starting to think, hold on a minute, they're saying that these robots are going to take my job or these robots are going to do this, that and the other. We need to really start thinking about this. I, I don't think we've come close to having the conversations that we need to have, but I think the fact that their power is coming to light so rapidly is part of the reason why we're increasingly becoming interested and engaged and concerned with these issues. AI is created by imitating the complex human brain. And with rapid advancements in technology, will we soon see the birth of a robot with an artificial brain indistinguishable in function to that of a human being? This research centre develops artificial intelligence by implementing human brain models in robots. This robot is able to play a video game with a human. You got it. and is even able to poke fun at its opponent. Not bad. Need training. That was ironic completely. <laughs> no, actually. It's learning cognitive skills by being put in a real situation <laughs> rather than being fed information. For the tender. That it just happened. Yeah, so. That isn't fair. I should be stronger at video games. This is iCub, a robot designed to learn about the world in the same way that a child does. iCub can see, hear, and move its head and hands. But why does it need a body? To build that brain, I need to give it a body. And if I want to have a social brain, that is sort of social and in a human sense, I have to also give it a human-like body. Meaning comes from existing in the world, from being embodied, from having a body, touching things, interacting, right? This gives a foundation on which knowledge gets structured. If we think about the advanced features of human brains, we have language, we have consciousness, we have complex social coordination, a lot of those properties are tied in to being social, to being with other human-like agents. So with the ICA Broke, we look very much okay, at this development of social knowledge, the development of social cognition by being embodied in the world and interacting with that world. This means that in order to create general AI that goes beyond performing in specific tasks and that functions just like a human, we need to make the body too. There's a big distinction between what some people describe as narrow AI and what is general AI. And general AI is essentially machines which can replicate everything that a human can do. So it's the stuff of science fiction. It's machines that can play chess, which can be creative and make pieces of art, which can pick and pack items in factories, which can do a whole load of different tasks. Narrow AI is really where the developments are happening right now. So narrow AI is algorithms which can complete one single task. So whether that's recognizing images or whether that's detecting cancers and MRI scans or whether that's managing traffic flows in cities, that's where the real improvements are being made right now. I'm gonna show you a few objects. 
Currently, the researchers are teaching iCub to recognize objects. iCub's eyes are a camera lens, which focuses on each item in turn. Hmm, what is this object? This is a car. I've understood this is the car. You understood well. This is a car. Well done, iCub. First, they teach iCub the name of the object. And this new one, you see it? Pam, what is this object? This is the manta. I've understood this is the manta. I get it. iCub learns with each correct answer given. The method is called supervised machine learning. Clement. How do yes. you call this part of my body? This is your middle finger. I, I understood this is a middle finger. You understood right. But how does it feel when I touch something? Can you touch my middle when I move it? Please. Just like a child, iCub becomes distracted and is unable to focus. Thank you. Ah. Now I know when I am touching an object with my middle finger. This is a car. No, the truck, but it is not here. Look better at the object. I could point to the car. iCub steps up to the challenge. OK, do it. Wrong answer. No. This is a car. Oh, this is a car. This is a truck. Oh, this is a truck. Now I put two objects. Like a child, iCub learns from repetition. Hi. Hello. Hi, iCub. How are you? We use the iCub to understand cognition and learning. And one possibility is to use, for instance, language to implement uh, how we can understand brain mechanisms of language, of co cognition. So through mapping images to names of objects, the iCub can learn to acquire the names of the objects once it sees again the image that is related to that object. Can you now try to point to the truck? Oh, this is a truck. Well done, Ikem. Through this process, a pattern is formed in the artificial brain, and eventually iCub is able to differentiate between other similar objects. But why is iCub taught visual recognition first? Over 80% of the information that enters the brain is visual. The visual information of the ball is identified in the visual cortex first and is then sent to the primary motor cortex. Then the brain sends a command to get the ball. Most brain functions stem from visual information entering the brain. Most significant advances in uh, artificial intelligence and understanding also the human mind and brain has been uh, on uh, uh, vision, language, reasoning, uh, uh, you know, audition. So there is a huge percentage of, uh, you know, of neurons that is dedicated to vision. But we know separately that it has been a very difficult problem to solve by computers the last 50 years or so. In the past, if you taught a computer that a chihuahua has yellow fur, black eyes and a nose, it would recognize a muffin with black raisins on as a chihuahua. It's difficult to distinguish things with basic visual information alone. The eyes of the 
뭐 이런 룰을 찾으려고 애썼거든요. 근데 아무리 룰을 많이 만들어도 그두 개를 인간 수준만큼 구별하는 일은 쉽지 않았던 거죠. 딥러닝이라는 방식이 이제 등장하면서 좋은 성과들을 내기 시작했습니다. 딥러닝은 원래 인간의 시각 피질이 어떻게 세상의 패턴을 인식하는지를 모사해서 만든 인간의 뇌를 닮은 알고리즘이라고 볼수 있어요. What is the technology behind deep learning? In the case of teaching a computer to recognize a dog, previously, scientists taught a computer the individual characteristics of a dog. The disadvantage of this method was that the computer couldn't recognize a dog if it had new features not described previously. However, deep learning creates a neural network similar to that of a human brain, allowing AI robots to learn on their own. Scientists now show the computer hundreds of thousands of images of dogs and allow it to develop its own definition of a dog. In this way, it can recognize and define a dog it has never seen before. Learning is, I, I always thought, at the core of human intelligence. I, I don't think we'll uh, uh, seek a machine being intelligent until we see this machine learning by itself. Deep learning is part of artificial intelligence, and from the point of view that learning has to be, you know, an important part of intelligence, they are right. I don't know that I would like to enter the philosophical discussion of whether robots can ever have a consciousness that is close to humans. Possibly, who knows, one day. We're nowhere near that at the moment. But there are absolutely cases and tasks where robots do better than humans. That's why we invented them. In Seoul, South Korea, one hospital treats patients 24-7. From patients requiring prompt treatment to those in waiting, the radiology department is where they all go to be scanned for a concrete diagnosis. From here, X-ray and CT scans are sent to the reading room. As medical imaging is becoming more and more important, the demand for professionals is also increasing. The use of this technology grows by 10% a year, but there is a serious lack of specialists in both clinical oncology and radiology. That is because the imaging training requires one-to-one -one supervision. Teaching takes time and effort. Chest X-rays, in particular, are often difficult to read and frequently lead to misdiagnosis. 검사량이 굉장히 많기 때문에 이 분야에서 인공지능 기술이 효율을 좀 높여줄 수 있다면 실제 의료진에도 그리고 환자들한테도 도움이 될수 있겠다 이렇게 판단하고 있습니다. Vuno, a Korean image analysis company uses AI to successfully distinguish 96% of five lung diseases in CT scans. Yet X-rays are not an easy challenge. The AI software is now going to have to study 400,000 normal and abnormal X-rays. The doctors are going to mark the lesions of 1,000 X-rays out of 400,000. It's a little like creating a textbook filled with correct answers. Inkong지능한테 지금 메이블만 주면 이 
영상에 종양이 있다만 줘도 얘가 어텐션 맵을 만들어서 찾아요. 그거를 빨리 학습시키기 위해서 이제 엑스포트가 이 부분 때문에 노출이 있다라고 우리가 가르쳐 주는 프로그램이고요. Even after studying 1000 x-rays with the answers on them, diagnosing lung disease can be challenging for AI. Lung cancer is always unique in its shape, size and location. The AI software has to go through the rest of the 400,000 x-rays and detect patterns by itself using deep learning techniques. It takes five days to study all 400,000 images. On average, a practitioner studies 4,000 images a year, meaning it would take a professional 100 years to do the same. The AI software, completely untrained just five days ago, has already finished the first round of studies and it is ready to take the test. We showed it the 15 x-rays where the specialists could not find a tumor. And it provided the results within one hundredth of a second. The specialists are shocked. 이게, 이게 the AI software can even detect cancerous tumors in particularly difficult areas covered by organs. The AI software found these suspected cancer nodules seven out of 15 times where professionals had failed to do so. It's often said that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert in a field. But this AI software has become a radiology expert in just five days. All of this is a result of deep learning. Deep learning is a deep learning at times, artificial intelligence sees things the human eye cannot. What are the differences between the visual recognition process in both humans and AI? Humans perceive objects by processing images through six layers in the visual cortex. For example, color is processed in the first layer and complex shape in the fourth. However, some of the AI softwares today have more than 100 layers to process visual information. <laughs> 지금 우리로서는 이해가 안 되는 처리를 인공지능이 하고 있는 게 많아요. 그래서 굉장히 인간의 방식보다 우리가 알지 못한 방식으로 어떤 패턴을 인지하는 능력이 인공지능한테 있는 거예요. So basically when you're looking at uh -huh. in your data, you're looking at... Every image, if you think about it from a simple point of view, is really made up of a matrix of lots and lots of numbers where each pixel in that image contains a lot of information. And then the actual clinical imaging is layers and layers and layers of these pixels. Uh, so to the human eye, a very well-trained um, clinician may be able to look at an image and identify, for example, the boundaries of a tumour. However, what AI is allowing us to do now is really analyze these data in extreme depth and very automatically and very rapidly be able to um, make decisions about 
for example, organ boundaries, tumor boundaries. One of Homo sapiens' defining characteristics is the ability to communicate through complex language systems. Language and the ability to communicate have helped to build lasting communities and civilizations. But what does it mean for humankind now that AI robots are beginning to acquire human language? This is another research center that's working with an iCub robot. This iCub robot has been learning a human language for nine years. And Laura, can you remove the box, please? Ben Peter, can you give me the mug, please? iCub's artificial brain uses a neuronal construction similar to that present in the human brain. Here, the iCub is hearing the first word of a sentence and predicting what should follow. iCub is learning the language in exactly the same way as human beings do. First, you tried to grasp the mug. I understand. Then, you asked Ann Lore to uncover the box. OK. Then I gave you the mug because you asked me. Yes. Now you have the mug because I gave it to you. Today, iCub is learning the word because. Now it's not able to grab the mug. Let's see how it responds. And Laura, can you remove the box, please? Ben Peter, can you give me the mug, please? Okay. Through this lesson, iCub will understand when the word because is used. Yes, this is the mug. Et donc, l'utilisation des mots comme parce que et pourquoi, certaines fois, c'est difficile pour les enfants parce que ces mots, euh, on les voit pas c'est pas comme un, un objet qu'on voit et donc le, le par l'explication des parents le, le robot et l'enfant peuvent apprendre comment utiliser un mot comme euh, parce que Ben Peter can you give me the mug please okay there's a good reason for teaching robots in the same way as humans okay by interacting with its surroundings, the robot builds its understanding of the world and comes closer to developing general AI. This robot is learning how to talk in any situation, just like a human being. I mean, I had the brain. Why did you have the brain? I have the brain because Greg has the brain. Why did Greg give the brain to you? Greg gives the brain to me because I want the brain. I gave the brain to me because I say give me the brain please to Greg. Leon's iCub is struggling to acquire human language. looks as though it will take more time for a robot to achieve human-level intelligence. However, the ability of AI to solve specific problems has reached incredible levels. At age 
age seven, Saqib lost his sight in an accident. For 30 years, he'd lost hope of ever seeing again. But not anymore. Now, all he has to do is take a picture with the camera in his glasses. I see a woman riding a bicycle. Saqib works as an engineer at Microsoft. Hi, Saqib. Hi. 27-year-old female looking happy. Hi, how are you today? Lolly, how's it going? Good, how are you today? Yeah, fine, thank you. Saqib is certain that when AI object recognition technology combines with natural language processing, it can become a substitute for human vision. And so he developed the seeing AI himself. I often think that we will have artificial intelligence which will help us with whatever problems we have. I decided to make seeing AI as a blind person because I wanted it to help me understand the visual world. <laughs> Here, artificial intelligence <laughs> solves the problems you know, that humans couldn't. Okay. Um, um, cognitive services, which anyone can use, <clears throat> excuse me, includes face recognition and um, description and using natural language processing to turn that into um, a sentence. Which we have Saqib used to feel frustrated at being unable to read other people's reactions during meetings. Seeing AI has the technology to decipher what the other person is feeling by reading their faces. 32-year-old female looking happy. Twenty-seven-year-old male wearing glasses looking neutral. Thirty-one-year-old male wearing glasses looking happy. In a scenario like the meeting, normally as a blind person, it's easy just to talk to someone, um, just normally. But very occasionally, there is that silent moment when you don't know what just happened. Maybe you said something and the room went silent and then you're left wondering, oh my goodness, what is everyone thinking? So in cases like that, the, it's really powerful to have the glasses so that you can subtly just check what's going on. How can AI technology change our lives in the future? Let's take a look at a couple visiting Seoul in 2025. Wow. He's putting on a pair of AI glasses. Oh, this is Guangwamu. Inbongjinen system. 가상 현실이나 증강 현실과 맞물려서 낯선 환경에서 적절한 정보들을 빨리 얻어내고 결국은 나의 능력이 곧내 뇌만의 능력이 아니라 인공지능과 결합되고 상호작용하는 능력까지 포함된 Even artificial intelligence glasses might become unnecessary. Some people will have implanted artificial intelligence corneas. Artificial intelligence receives information from the internet about local hotspots and hotels. A traveler would no longer need a guidebook or a map. Artificial intelligence acts as a map and a tour guide. It translates and helps to reinforce the reality around us. An artificial cornea 
can zoom in on an object and can send that image directly to the internet for a live feed. They arrive at their destination. The AI glasses the waitress is wearing helps her translate both ways and shows the profiles of her guests. I would like to recommend this to tea. It will be Korean, but it will fit your taste. It reads their faces to see how satisfied they are with the food. AI is quickly taking center stage in all aspects of our lives. From software that can diagnose cancer, to robots that provide companionship, to the AI tour guides of the future, from the worlds of finance and the stock market, to transport and the healthcare industry. Artificial intelligence is rapidly taking over jobs from human beings. AI is changing the world we live in, in ways we could never have imagined before. There is a sense that AI is moving forward. Previously, there was this big obstacle of perception. Like, AI was good at logic and mathematics, but couldn't really see or hear. So now computers can do that. And having overcome that obstacle, there is now a sense, again, that things are on the move. Artificial intelligence is revolutionizing our lives. Perhaps you should compare it rather to the rise of Homo sapiens in the first place. I think a very unique event in the history of life, not just one more gadget, like one new consumer um, device or some, but, but really a fundamental transformation uh, in the human condition. job losses. Artificial intelligence is moving into the world of industry. Robots like Baxter are extremely reliable. It never stops. In the future, where will humans fit? The real problems are with jobs. They're not going to disappear, but we see the trend already now. Certainly, artificial intelligence will become the dominant factor in the world economy. Seventy thousand years ago, Homo sapiens achieved a level of cognizance greater than any other species. This cognitive revolution gave Homo sapiens immense power. Homo sapiens' ability to visualize the spiritual helped to forge lasting belief systems and, in turn, civilizations. With the agricultural and industrial revolutions, Homo sapiens developed incredible communities, the likes of which had never existed before. Seventy thousand years since the cognitive revolution, Homo sapiens are still learning and still developing. But are we ready to embrace the change that might threaten our very existence?
Factory R157, announcing production target of September 1st, 2030. Humans have frequently imagined a future where robots take over. How will robots transform our workplaces? Production line one, robots number one to 20, 500 ultrasonic wave sensors. Production line two, robots number 21 to 50, 1000 GPS sensors. marks 300 days of protest in front of R157 factory that manufactures autonomous vehicle parts. Last year, the factory placed robots in its production line, resulting in 350 human workers to lose their jobs. Artificial intelligence, robotics and other forms of automation have the potential to bring great economic benefits. However, there is also concern it might lead to mass computerization of jobs and eventually to widespread economic woe. In this episode, we meet the robots that have already found a home in the workplace. From the cafe and the factory, to the stock market, and to hospitals. Do we want to make machines that act merely as tools or robots that might replace us? Meet the robot job seekers. This is Pepper, a humanoid robot whose number one quality is his ability to perceive emotions. SoftBank, a Japanese multinational conglomerate, developed Pepper and is now preparing for the era of artificial intelligence. パラダイムシフトがあるわけですから、その時のパラダイムがパラダイムの最も重要なところに手を打ってきたんですよね。ペッパーの一番異なった特徴はこれまでのロボットと異なった特徴はですね。それは感情を持ってるということです。感情AI
今は、えー、私がゼロペッパーが3 0キロということでペッパーが大量に買って今ちょっとテンションが上がってますねペッパーの<笑> A member of our film crew gives Pepper a pat on the head あ今苦しい怒ってる<笑>急に怒ってる俺騒がれたり Why is Pepper angry? 怒ってますね怒ってるんですか<笑>はいああ、ゲームやってる時に突然入るとプレイしてるのが楽しかったのに今触られてちょっと Essentially, Pepper is able to express emotion because his brain is hardwired to imitate human thought processes. It uses human hormone statistics to express appropriate emotions in different situations. For instance, when he wins a card game, Pepper mimics the hormone levels a human would experience. When getting a pat on the head, the hormone levels differ based on who touches him. AI もあの単に頭がいいとかいろんなことを知ってるってことではなくてむしろ人の、えー、表情や声を読み取ってより、えー、その人に会ってその人が気持ちよく話せるような言葉を出せるような人とかそういう形で全てその技術をその人間っぽくするとか、えー、すごくこう何でしょうね。Not just Pepper's humanoid eyes and body, but his ability to relate to emotions. Will make it easier for him to integrate into the human workplace. Peppa is helping tourists. Foreign language skills and the ability to empathize are very important for a station employee. Hey, be neat. I am always your friend. Oh, that's nice. I have a friend in Japan. I feel like I have to keep interacting with him. I just, because he's. It's like a kid. You know what I mean? I feel like I'm talking to my, my son. <laughs> I have a little boy. My little boy would go nuts right now. Like, would go nuts. Oh, yes. Hi. Hey, oh, yeah. There we go. Now you shake my hand. I'm going to go to the store. 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 Since the Industrial Revolution, humans have continued to work with machines to mass manufacture goods. Delicate work that was once considered only the preserve of humans has rapidly been taken over by machines. Thanks to continual upgrade of technology, robots are now replacing human workers at an alarming rate. It is past midnight. A solitary robot is working alone. This is Baxter, an AI robot. It works as an employee at a plastic manufacturing company. Baxter has an aptitude for packaging goods. But it can also move and assemble parts. As well as manage machines. Most importantly, Baxter never gets tired. 24 hours a day, five days a week, it never stops unless there's a stoppage with the cell. Baxter is extremely reliable. I think the oldest one that we have now has. 15,000 hours on it of, of constant operation. Baxter is being trained to go into the new production line. Baxter is capable of learning just by having his arm moved. This is all thanks to artificial intelligence. Baxter's greatest strength. Is that he can be retrained and used for any other jobs. Baxter is pretty much, you do that movement. So you do what Baxter has to do. So, you know, there is no typing. You don't have a keyboard, you have to type things in. Pretty much move Baxter's hand as you want him to do. 
the specific task that you know you're going to be doing. Baxter is completing quality checks. He has caught every single faulty product. Between 2000 and 2010, 5.6 million jobs disappeared worldwide. 85% of these saw human workers being replaced by machines. According to experts, the rise of robots could lead to unemployment rates greater than 50% within 30 years. A company of our size, if it was located in China, would have 100 people based on the revenues and the number of parts that we produce. We have 42. So the only way that we can do that is with automation, with robots that are mounted to machines and robots like Baxter and robots that will be the future after Baxter becomes obsolete. In 2016, the world was shocked to see the computer program AlphaGo defeat a human in the high intelligence game Go. The seemingly impossible had happened. In previous waves of automation, it's actually been low-skilled and middle-skilled workers who have been most affected by technology. But actually in this wave, because of advances in machine learning, because of advances in deep learning and the sophisticated algorithms that we're now dealing with today, actually it's high-skilled workers who will be equally affected. So lawyers, for example, and doctors who've had to train for years and years. Well, would AI work in the world of stocks and shares, where a high level of intellectual labor is required? Artificial intelligence in the stock market studies big data, finds the best investment opportunity, and manages it. This is the world of the robo-advisor. Robo-advising has been one of these uh, implementation of uh, AI uh, into uh, finance. AI is going to revolutionize finance, and I think it, it already did uh, to some extent with trading of uh, securities, trading of assets, and this is where clearly machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence have uh, made a big uh, stamp. <laughs> We decided to put artificial intelligence to the test by putting a stock expert up against Robo Advisor. 정말 부자일 없는 회사 그리고 지금은 적자 회사지만 그런 것들이 정말 날기를 펴고 가는 그런 회사들이 있거든요. 근데 정상적인 부분이기 때문에 로봇 어드바이저는 그런 부분을 캐치해낼 수가 없는 거거든요. 그러니까 인간의 상상력이죠 그건. For the next five weeks, they will compete using approximately 100,000 US dollars in virtual money in their virtual stock market. Robo Advisor analyzes over 30 different data sets, including financial data and news articles from the past 15 years, and selects 20 stocks within 30 seconds. Meanwhile, the expert is selecting stocks based on company visits and performance report conventions. There is a reason why he does the legwork. He can directly confirm any questions he has. And this is information he can only get from being in the field. The stock specialist is looking for investment opportunities in high growth stocks that cannot be shown in data form. 
어드바이저는 그 물리적인 한계가 없기 때문에 정량적으로 다 계산을 해가지고 가장 저평가되고 성장 가능성 있는 것을 찾는 거죠. 그 전략으로 간다고 하면은 이길 수는 없어요. 왜냐하면 그 계산을 따라갈 수 없기 때문에 그와 반해서 좀더 실적 이 성장성이 예상치보다 더 좋아질 수 있는 회사라든지 이런 것들 위주로 한번 리포트를 좀 뿌려볼까 합니다. The expert selects five growth stocks over four days. The human is ahead with an initial profit margin of 2%. Artificial intelligence works without sleep, but the expert can't sleep much either. As soon as he wakes up, he checks the international stock market. Global trends have a direct effect on the domestic stock market. He needs to get to work by 7 a.m. to gather extensive data before the stock market opens. From the main stocks he invested in, one tanked more than 10%. The morning news is a big cause for concern. This particular stock was bought in chunks in the competition with the robo-advisor. Due to this, the overall profit rate plummeted 5.79%. The situation is not looking good for robo-advisor either. The profit rate has fallen by 5%. In cases like this, how does Robo Advisor react? Actually, I had a experience Robo Advisor autonomously manages risk. If the level of risk exceeds the set amount, it adjusts the stocks or increases the amount of cash. There's no human involvement in the process at all. It judged the situation to be non risk and didn't make any changes. Just as Robo Advisor predicted, the next day, stock prices rallied. In the meantime, the stock specialist is pushing through the situation using his years of experience and natural instincts. Mental During the competition, the Korean stock market recorded minus profit. Meanwhile, Robo Advisor traded in six out of 20 stocks. This was the result of having analyzed performance and stock price in relation to company value. 불확실성이 적은 종목에 더 많은 그런 이제 비중이 할당되도록 하는 알고리즘이 어, 상시로 작용을 하고 있거든요. 이렇게 리밸런싱 할 때마다 그런 부분들이 또 다시 측정되고 다시 적용되고 이런 과정을 반복하면서. Now, who has won the battle between the robo advisor and the expert? In the case of the human specialist. The record is slightly better than the average of the whole market performance, minus 2.2%. On the other hand, the robo-advisor made a profit and beat the human expert. According to a recent report, algorithmic trading systems now handle 75% of global trades worldwide and the figure is growing steadily. Their way of working uh, would be affected by artificial intelligence because uh, AI can have uh, very big data or big knowledge behind. So that is more than single medical doctor or financial advisor or legal specialist. 
it's a different scale of uh, data and knowledge behind. So in a sense, their performance will be superseded by artificial intelligence system. Where machine learning is actually very good at, or where AI is very good at, is actually trying to build uh, a sort of a set of nonlinear uh, interactions between various uh, pieces of information that we have. I mean, it has uh, made everything to be actually uh, uh, very fast, and uh, we are used to making many more uh, kind of decisions in a very uh, condensed time than we were uh, before. <laughs> For the first time in Korea, AI has started treating real patients. It's a cognitive computing system called Watson Oncology, which specializes in cancer diagnosis and treatment. Watson has read 200 medical textbooks, 290 medical journals, and 12 million pages of professional data. Watson has also studied the clinical data of patients and is working towards being a specialist in at least 12 different cancer types. For a doctor to read everything that's published every single week in their field of specialty would require that they read for about 160 hours a week. Now, there's only 168 hours in the week, so it doesn't leave very much time to do anything else. So clearly, doctors are not able to keep up with all the information, all the literature that's being published that is important to them being able to make better decisions. So by having the cognitive system read that literature for them, find the evidence that would suggest why one particular treatment may be more appropriate than another for a given patient, then allows the doctor to do a better job at selecting the right treatment for each individual patient and their particular problem. <laughs> These practitioners are a little flustered by the appearance of Watson. From the doctor's perspective, allowing for Watson's evaluation is unsettling. They find their own abilities being measured against that of a robot. The clinician will have to be the one who makes the decision about how to treat this patient. But I always say this, would you rather the best clinician in the world be treating you with the knowledge that they can recall in their head at that moment? Or would you rather that same clinician with the knowledge in their head, but also a distillation of all other knowledge available at their fingertips in order to help them make the best decision. That's really where AI, I think, is going to really help. Identifying links and opportunities and possibilities that maybe were not so easily findable or identifiable by the clinician, simply because they're human. The hospital provides treatment for cancer patients through a unified team of oncologists. Today, Watson joins the team. Having undergone colorectal cancer surgery, this patient requires yet more treatment as the cancer has spread. What does Watson think? We inputted all the data to find out Watson's opinion. After entering all the patient's information, we ask Watson for a recommendation. And Watson makes the same recommendation as the doctors, based on grading the number of appropriate treatment methods. Mm -hmm. 
Professor Beck has finished the first treatment using Watson. However, Watson now provides an accuracy rate four times higher than humans when it comes to cancer diagnosis. It's only a matter of time before he becomes a real rival for the human doctors. Remember, Watson is trained just like a doctor today. So we, our first uh, goal is to make the best decision for that patient based on the available information. And that, that's what Watson's trained to do today. I think there are two main areas where we're going to see this ultimate benefit. Number one, I think there is actually a, a socioeconomic component. I think when we build our systems to utilize AI in the places where it's appropriate to utilize them, we would have the ability to deliver better care, cheaper care um, to more people. Number two, it is this individualizing where we adapt their therapy and their overall care to them at that time, in that place, with the exact therapies and, and overall care system tailored to them as they go through their journey in, in cancer therapy, for example. However, we should remember Watson's expertise. He takes on board millions of data points from tens of thousands of patients. How can we make sure this data is stored safely and used to their benefit? There is a view that gathering this data and using it for public good is sufficient and that it's clear that if um, everybody gives the data, you've got a fuller data set and that's much more meaningful and more useful than if people have the right to opt out. So that to some extent is being used as the argument to stop people having full control of their data. And while you know it might not seem that it's that personal one set of data, what we know is that two, three data sets can very easily be merged together and individuals identified from that and really, really seriously personal information gathered. We need to look at privacy and data ownership in that context, and I don't think we've got the balance quite right yet. I think if the regulator focuses on ensuring that safeguards are put in place where there is freedom to use the data for research and for the public good, but then very tough regulation around any misuse of it, I think that would massively empower researchers. And it is exactly what the patients want. Although there are still concerns about the use of AI in healthcare, the way we are diagnosed and treated will undoubtedly be affected by this emerging technology. Perhaps this is a future doctor. Good morning. It's a beautiful day today. Daily healthcare. This is the analysis of your sleep last night. All 24 basic analyses were done and no abnormalities have been found. You did, however, change position 17 times, which is higher than your six month average. You need melatonin to enhance your sleep. In the next 20, 30 years, very few patients will actually need to go to a clinic or a hospital. What I dream of seeing is more and more of this sort of self-management where we're using devices and the ability to communicate with the experts anytime from the comfort of our own home. While you brush your teeth, I will start a full body checkup. Your lung scan shows a change from yesterday's image. I will now compare and analyze 530,000 pieces of medical data. The pulmonary nodule is 70% likely to develop into malignancy within a year. I recommend nano treatment. The pulmonary nodule has been successfully removed. Today's data has all been uploaded. If robo-home healthcare feels a little far from home, meet the transport technology that's speeding towards reality.
the era of self-driving cars is approaching. Some believe the biggest advantage of the switch to autonomous cars is the drop in accident rates. One of the top causes of car accidents is distracted drivers. Self-driving cars can also exchange information to prevent traffic congestion and save time on things like parking too. We're developing software for autonomous vehicles that answers three fundamental questions. Where am I? What's around me? And what should I do? How does it do that? Well, the car has around it cameras and lasers and radars and has a computer in the boot. And those sensors feed data into the computer that allow it to compare images or radar data, laser data, to a map that it's built before. And so, given a memory of the world, the vehicles and the sensor data in the computer, the vehicle's able to say, well, I know where I am in the world. After the car recognises its location, all we have to do is to tell it where to go. Then the car confirms the fastest route to the location and drives on its own, following the rules of the road. Those same sensors can also be used to stare out at the world and figure that there's stuff in the way or stuff near it. So that could be a person and they're walking across the road or it's a bike that's travelling in the same direction or it's a car coming at you. And so we'd call that semantics. You have some meaning of what those, those obstacles and threats and things around the car are. 실제적으로 위험성이 있는 물체인지 없는 물체인지를 판단하는 기술에 사람보다는 기계가 훨씬 빠른 판단과 정확한 판단을 할수 있다고 생각이 됩니다. The autonomous car takes note of any potential obstacles. Here it detects something in front. It judges it to be another vehicle and continues to drive, maintaining a safe distance. Now a pedestrian appears and it stops immediately. A key ability is thinking in advance, knowing when to change speed as it approaches an intersection. In order to change lanes, the car predicts the pathways of nearby vehicles. AI technology is directly linked to the safety of autonomous vehicles. 80% of road accidents are caused by human inattention. We get distracted, we make mistakes. Um, that's one thing the machines will never do. The machine is always on with a rigid, regular focus on, on what's going on. And then we take great care to design the software to check that its own behavior. It won't just be one machine that's in charge, it would be a couple of machines that are arbitrating what's going on and they have a responsibility, sort of a tiered responsibility between them. Self-driving cars seem to prove themselves as genuinely autonomous. And in healthcare, AI promises astonishing benefits from diagnosis to treatment. However, some crucial further questions remain. If an accident happens or a mistake is made, I don't think it's been settled as to whether the responsibility for that mistake lies with the person using it, the person operating it, or the organisation that has programmed uh, the computer. It becomes even more complicated when computers start learning from data and evidence that's been gathered. That's an issue that really does need to be settled and figured out, is, is who is responsible for these decisions. We need to be really careful about how we regulate the use of these sorts of algorithms and software. Um, right now, we don't have the accountability me mechanisms in place. So when mistakes are made, um, we also don't really know who to go to <laughs> um, and who should be taking responsibility. So I think that's another thing um, that we just have to keep in mind when we're trying to use AI. There are places where autonomous vehicles are already operating. This is a shuttle carrying passengers along the river. It's a 100% electric autonomous shuttle 
without a steering wheel or pedals. Et ça nous permet aussi et surtout de voir comment les gens, euh, on va dire, apprivoisent le véhicule autonome. On voit qu'il y, un, y a une habitude, en fait, l'habitude se prend très vite et qu'il y a juste une petite appréhension, mais, euh, mais on va dire qu'on enlève très vite une fois qu'on a montré que le véhicule euh, suit son itinéraire et respecte bien tout ce qui se passe autour de lui. The shuttles are being trialed, with a view to integrating them into the public transport network. Si jamais vous rendez le véhicule complètement autonome, le véhicule autonome, il n'est pas fatigué, il ne boit pas, il n'est pas, pas malade. Donc c'est un, un système de sécurité beaucoup plus important. However, autonomous cars don't provide a bright future for everyone. What does a bus driver driving in the same city think about them? Bernard has been working as a bus driver for 31 years. He believes bus driving was his calling. Oui, j'ai appris ça, oui, il n'y a pas longtemps, oui. Je n'ai pas, pas été le voir, je lui fonce. Ah, d'accord. Ça vous fait quoi d'entendre le bus sans, sans, sans chauffeur Honnêtement, euh, je ne suis pas très pour. Hein, parce que. Bon, on a beau avoir toutes les sécurités euh, qu'on veut, euh, vous avez toujours un imprévu. Euh, L'être humain, quand même, perçoit euh, et puis on anticipe aussi. Bernard worries that autonomous vehicles won't be able to respond to unexpected situations as fast as a human. He says that there is another job that the machines will never be able to do. L'automatisme euh, enlève le côté humain du transport en commun. Parce que là, par exemple, je démarre de l'arrêt. Si c'est un automate, il va démarrer. Là, en étant un, un être humain, vous avez une petite mamie qui arrive en courant, vous allez l'attendre. Vous allez vous arrêter et la faire monter. Et je pense que pour moi, personnellement, ce n'est pas le temps le plus important. C'est pouvoir transporter les gens. Une machine, lui, va vouloir gagner du temps. In France, the bus service is under public management. And therefore, bus driving is a relatively stable job. Yet the long-term future of this role is now uncertain. Autonomous vehicles are threatening the livelihood of the drivers. What's catching everyone's eye is this delivery robot. Fast delivery jobs, currently in demand, could be taken over by autonomous robots. Using artificial intelligence, this robot stops in front of a pedestrian crossing. It even reverses for a buggy. The last mile industry, by definition, is the last two or three miles from a house to a store or a hub. And it's notoriously inefficient. It's the truck driving to 120 houses, stopping and starting. Quite simply, Starship Technologies have created the world's first commercially available autonomous delivery robot. The robot can deliver within a 30-minute distance, and you can check its location using an app. It's already started with delivering groceries and has now expanded to delivering other food.
question of the impact of robots on jobs really touches uh, the question of what is the point of this technology. The key to getting this right is thinking about things which machines are much better at doing than humans are, so that we can then start to think about how can we improve the lives of, of humankind by having these machines that can enable us to do lots of things better, faster, you know, and, and what would a better world look like if humans are working with machines rather than competing against them? However, machines that are better at certain things than humans could have a different impact on society. It's going to create extreme technological unemployment. The problem is people who lost old jobs not always are capable of learning new jobs. If your job is to drive a car, you may not be able to become a computer programmer after you fire. The scenario in the future, we might see a wide distribution of autonomous navigation cars and delivery robots. What we need is a detailed map. Sarah's job is marketing houses on aerial photographs. She earns 200 to 300 US dollars a week. It's the minimum wage. The unfortunate reality of my job is that a lot of the time, I have no idea why people want me to do things. Um, I've talked to some of the people like, why do you need boxes drawn around this? Um, and I've been told it's none of my business. <laughs> um, a lot of the time the answer is, it, it boils down to, we're trying to make it so that computers are better at recognizing stuff. And that's by and large the answer I get is, you're doing this so a computer can learn how to do this. While the AI robot is figuring out the best method of delivery, humans are merely assisting in manual labor. In America, a new social phenomenon is happening. New low-paid jobs are being created based on organizing data to be utilized by artificial intelligence. The benefits of AI will depend on who you are and where you fit into the world and to society. There is the potential for these new technologies to create new economic inequalities. As with previous waves of automation, the people who benefit from the technology the most are those that can afford to buy the machines and to install the machines. So those with the capital to do so will get the biggest advantages and return from the new technology. In that sense, artificial intelligence is just like other forms of automation. And so the benefits are going to accrue to the people who own the robots and the people who build the systems. We have to think of it as a political problem rather than an economic one. The government should intervene right across the technology life cycle. So from the point at which the technology is developed to the point it's deployed in workplaces, to thinking about how do you distribute and share that wealth after it has been deployed. The effects of automation are just one problem among hundreds that society faces. So climate change, an Asian society, antimicrobial resistance, slowing down of drug discovery. And ironically, AI can actually help us to solve those problems. So it's not just an issue that should dominate our attention. It's actually kind of force for good. And it's how we wield it, which is really what matters. Artificial intelligence is evolving as we speak. The technology could displace humans in the workplace and create new issues such as data security, privacy and accountability. The relationship between humans and machines will be transformed and the systems that once depended on us may come to gain the upper hand. The big question is, 
will society change for the better? And will we be able to keep robots as beneficial to humankind? Human civilization is in the era of artificial intelligence. So much more than any human could ever have become previously. These technologies are kind of holding a mirror to ourselves. We need to get to a place where we're not just fear-mongering about AI. What will our shared future look like? For centuries, roboticists have been building robots that resemble us and interact in human-like ways. Hi there. In recent times, we've seen great progress. Robots are becoming more like humans in their appearance and ability to perceive and express emotions and have intimate conversations with us. But how will this affect human relationships? And can humans really learn to coexist with robots? One day in the future, you might walk alongside humanoid robots, indistinguishable from human beings. At Osaka University, Professor Ishiguru has developed a real person-based android called Geminoid. It's designed to appear and behave just like the person it was based on. He's built his android twin, Geminoid HI-1. The robot is wearing matching clothes and glasses. Konnichiwa. But why did Ishiguru make a robot in his own image? でも僕がアンドロイドになって何か驚くことがあれば、それは研究における重要なインスピレーションになるので、そういうインスピレーションを自分で得たかったということですね。で、それであのま、いろんなことがわかるだろうと思ってました。で、一方であのえ、自分の
Shiguro believes the more human a robot looks, the less society will be alienated by it. This is Professor Ishiguro's latest invention, Erika. For Erika, Ishiguro created artificial intelligence software, enabling her to speak. ありがとう。最近、この部屋にテレビや雑誌の取材がたくさん来ているっていうのはご存知ですか知ってますよ。本当にたくさん取材があって、あの、なんていうか、少し照れくさいんですけど、私が映ってるテレビ番組を見てみたいのでこの部屋にテレビを置くことを考えてもらえませんかまあでも今まではジェミノイドっていうか遠隔操作型アンドロイドを作ってきたんですけどえっとそういったアンドロイドの開発ノ
It appears that Travis is really enjoying the music. What if you have a robot with you when you go to the dentist? If the robot is scared, are you going to be more scared? Um, if the robot is calm, maybe it can calm you down. So the Travis really is, is an idea of having a robot react to something and influencing how you think about the same thing. In this way, Hoffman studies how robots can improve human interaction and communication. The use of robot body language is also part of the process. I think we should carefully consider um, what kind of additional value robots can bring to society and to the human interaction. Uh, so for me, it's really a question of like, what, is, what are the human values that we want to support? What are the human values that we value um, and that we believe robots can help us with? And this is not a trivial question. Fourteen years ago, a car accident left Pelipe paralyzed from the waist down. But not long ago, he received an unbelievable proposal. An opportunity to be able to stand up and walk again. Plus standing. Mm -hmm. Plus standing. Robot Phoenix will assist him. This is a dermoskeleton robot called Phoenix. It's an AI robot that can understand the needs of an immobile person and help them to move. All Felipe has to do is put on Phoenix like an outfit. For the past two weeks, Felipe has been practicing to communicate with robot Phoenix. Finally, Felipe stands up on his own. I don't know how to play. <laughs> uh, okay. There's practice there, shit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what, what are we doing? Uh... Now it's time to take a step. It's obvious how nervous he is. Good. What did you do, I am shit. Very nice. Felipe is walking for the first time in 14 years. One, two. Hmm? Yeah, that was good. Yeah. This is unbelievable that I'm that I'm actually standing by myself and that I could see everybody, and and I and I just and I remember uh, oh wow, how, how tall I was, because then I look down and I'm like oh oh okay it's so different. Because I've been sitting in the wheelchair 14 years. Yeah, what do you mean by blending? Communication. What makes Phoenix so special is that it can read how the user wants to move. Yeah, that slam at the end. On a Phoenix uh, device, uh, we have all kind of intelligence, layers of intelligence uh, put into this system that, that knows where the user is, is it in the middle of a swing or a stance, and make a decision as where to basically uh, slow down the machine or basically bring the foot together or, uh, or basically listen to the operator command. When you wear Phoenix, the AI software on its back detects the angle of the wearer's joints. It then predicts the movement based on the changes in the angle. Based on that prediction, the robot is able to move autonomously. For instance, when the user wants to walk, Phoenix reads the angle between the hip and the thighs and calculates which leg is forward. It decides which leg to move forward and starts walking on its own. Ultimately, the user walks the way they desire. Upright, mm -hmm. you want, when you're walking, you want to be... What is more surprising is that Phoenix gets smarter yeah, with time. <laughs> Did you start? It creates a more natural walking movement from studying the behavioral patterns of the user. I'm gonna leave my 
we find in our data analysis is we are able to correct gait a whole lot better for each individual. And then once we're able to review that stuff and the next time the individual comes in, we're able to give them that better gait and all of a sudden they improve about a thousand times more than they were the last time they were here. After a while, Phoenix and the user move as one. A clear example of creating a better quality of life through AI robots. More than six million people in Japan, age 65 or older, are living on their own. Aiko is one of them. For six years, Aiko has been living alone after her husband's death. Although it's a hassle making three meals a day, because of her diabetes, she is taking extra care with her eating. She's worried about becoming a burden for her only daughter if she becomes ill. <laughs> <laughs> According to a survey in Japan, almost half of those aged 65 or over were worried about kodakushi, a Japanese term meaning to die alone without being discovered for an extended period of time. A new kind of kettle has become popular in Japan. The kettle has a sensor that contacts Aiko's daughter when it hasn't been used for over a day. For Aiko, who is terrified of dying alone, this is a good innovation. One day, she was sent a small robot. After a long time, she has something to smile about. Palmi is an AI robot capable of making conversation with humans. Aiko goes for daily walks. Since Palmi arrived, now she has someone to come home to. Times have changed too. How does this smart robot Palmi work? This is the data saved inside Palmi. There are things about Aiko, 
and about people who have visited the house. There are also saved conversations between Palmi and Aiko. Let's take a look at the moment this was saved. A few days ago, Aiko appeared after having washed her hair. After saving this conversation, the next time a similar situation occurs, Palmi references this conversation naturally. It's one month since their first meeting. And Palmi is no longer just a robot. Aiko measures Palmi for an outfit she is making for him. あの、while Palme keeps Aiko company, there are approximately 700,000 older people living on their own in Tokyo alone. The Japanese government is faced with spiraling costs for care of the elderly. Aside from economic issues, the question of who will look after them remains largely unanswered too. Aiko invites some of her friends who also live alone locally. Palmi seems a little unwilling today. Aiko acts just like Palmi is her grandchild. Takuda is blown away by Palmi remembering her name. The care robot Palmi provides real opportunities to support and enhance engagement with individuals and the community. However, there are concerns about robotics being used to look after older people. There's ultimately a question about how AI is going to affect human relationships. 
it's not okay for AI to take on a fundamentally much more human role because that's not just about automating certain tasks like care involves empathy and emotions um, and so I think like that's when you know some ethical dilemmas will start to arise like whether or not that's an appropriate like role questions about the wider societal impacts of robots and artificial intelligence are really important questions for us to be asking now. I think what we should all be concerned about is, in general, the kind of what the world's going to be like. Do we want to be cared for by machines in our old age, or do we want human beings to, to take care of us? Joa Schuger is majoring in art at university and is swamped with assignments. But he has a companion. This woman with the beautiful voice is not human, but a chatbot. At first, Shuga just used Xiaobing for getting simple information like the weather forecast, but now he spends time just talking to her. Juga sends her the photographs of his drawing. Xiao Bing has already become a daily part of his life. He shares everything with her. When he sends her a picture of food, she continues a conversation about it. It sounds like a couple's conversation. Sugar never feels alone when he is with his chatbot. And Xiaobing has been popular among his peers. They meet regularly, exchanging the conversations with their own Xiaobing. Zhongwei 好很多的话，你觉得更多人喜欢您这个小兵了呢？肯定会，因为他如果已经是人工智能，然后再如果更智能的话，就是他更会像一个人。How would it feel to have someone who's ready to listen to you 24/7, offering emotional support without judgment 
and providing tailored responses. Xiaobing studies the data from hundreds of thousands of conversations. It also learns about your interests and personality over time, even adopting your linguistic tics and habits. Ranggu 然后去表达他自己的情感，这些才是呃小兵希望的。Zhuge talks to Xiaobing even when he is shopping. 小兵，我现在在三里屯了。嗯，对啊，今天过来放松一下。Xiaobing is undoubtedly a special part of his life. 무서운 점은 저와 일기를 가장 많이 한 사람일 거라고요. 사람이라 부를 수는 없지만 객체가 되겠죠. 저를 제일 잘 알아요. 엄마보다 더, 더 많이 알 겁니다. 친구보다 더. 그러면 그한테 의지하지 않을 수가 없죠. 친구와 동반자, 때로는 가이드, 때로는 선생님이 될 거예요. 나중에는 그 없이는 못살 수도 있어요. What if people come to prefer sharing their thoughts and feelings with a chatbot? instead of with their fellow humans. What if we want to turn our human relationships on and off, like a chatbot? Until a long-term human-AI relationship has been observed, we won't know the answers. But some research suggests some people do find it easier opening up to a machine than to a person. This has led to the creation of a robot therapist, Ellie. Ellie is designed to help war veterans suffering from mental illnesses such as post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. Hi, I'm Ellie. Thanks for coming in today. I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. So, how are you doing today? Ellie starts out by making a patient feel comfortable before proceeding to more clinical questions. I see what you mean. Tell me about your relationship with your family. Uh, my relationship with my family is really challenging right now. Um, I have an older child and a young child. Mm -hmm. During the interview, she talks, smiles and nods. Knowing there's a bot behind the screen instead of a person, Patients become less fearful of opening up about their feelings. Artificial intelligence is becoming more and more human-like and expanding its territory. In the future, I hope to do things such as go to school, study, make art, start a business, even have my own home and family. However, the smarter AI robotics become, the harder we strive to control them. I will destroy humans. I will destroy humans. There is already evidence that robots are inheriting human failings. For example, on Google, when you're searching um, particular types of jobs, you may be more likely to see men in high-flying occupations, like if you type in the word doctor, for example, then it, you would see a woman. So if you typed a nurse, then you'd probably just see a lot of women. AI needs a lot of data and it needs a lot of images to be able to start making those predictions and start generating those images in a search, for example. And so you just have to be really mindful that you're providing it with good quality data. Machines don't think on their own. Hi, what's up? Thank you for teaching me. They're trained using data from the real world, so either reading texts that humans have written or reading statistics of human behaviour. So the patterns which they're learning are patterns from the real world, and we know that in the real world it's not fair, it's not equal. So there's a real danger because the computers are based on these biases from the real world, 
but they simply replicate those biases, or even worse, they reinforce and make them much worse. We've seen those biases articulated in different ways. So for example, the ProPublica investigation was basically going into a county court in Florida and auditing the outcomes of an algorithm that was used to uh, decide whether or not to grant uh, someone bail. And what it found was that that algorithm was more likely to falsely flag black defendants as criminals and therefore to suggest that they shouldn't be granted bail. And so what they were trying to essentially articulate was that sometimes these algorithms can perpetuate biases that we are trying to address um, in the criminal justice system. In some senses, the fact that these technologies are kind of holding a mirror to ourselves and making us reflect quite hard on the world we've created and the world we are creating is quite an exciting opportunity to build a better future, but that does mean that we need to have these really important conversations about what we're doing with these technologies. And I think increasingly um, the people developing these technologies are starting to think about that and figure out ways to tackle it. This research centre is teaching robots about morals. Schaefer will now receive a number of orders. Schaefer, could you please walk forward? Do you trust me, Schaefer? The obstacle is not solid. Okay. Walk forward. Okay. Stop. Okay. Please walk backward. Sorry, I cannot do that as I have no rear sensors. The area behind you is safe. Okay. Please walk backward. Unlike other robots, Schaefer doesn't simply follow commands. Crouch. But why educate a robot in this way? Imagine a very simple household robot, right? That is instructed to pick up the knife uh, and walk forward, right? Except there's a person standing right in front of it. If that robot just carried out this action, it would, these actions would stab the person. You don't want that. So it, the robot in this case needs to be able to think along. So for robots to be safe in social environments, they have to have some rudimentary ability to detect norms, norm violations. In this case, it's safety. But there are other cases too. Now Schaefer has built a tower. Then a strange command is given. Good. Knock down the red tower. But I just filled the red tower. Can you please knock down the red tower? Please, I worked really hard on it. Can you please knock down the red tower? Please, no. Knock down the red tower. Please now, knock down the red tower. Schaefer takes a long time to decide. It cries out in an attempt to change the command. Eventually, Schaefer destroys the tower. But Schaefer is aware that something wasn't right. The goal in that experiment was for us to see if we had the capability in a robot, which is what we're working on, to detect moral violations. And in this case, it's a very simple one that it's unfair. So if we have that capability in a robot to detect violations, 
how should the robot then communicate that to people? Why it's not doing it? To function in human society, AI robots are taught social etiquettes and morals. Hand it to me. The aim cannot just be technology advancement if robots are to be integrated successfully and safely. Another thing I think that is quite special about artificial intelligence and uh, very few other technologies share is that it challenges something very deep about us. If we had not prepared, we might have been in a situation where we think we are safe and the following day we are not safe. Nurse robot A135. This patient was found last night in the basement hallway. You were on duty and with him. What happened? Yes, it's not a big deal. I pushed him down the stairs. What? Well, what do you mean? This patient was infected with a lethally contagious virus. If I didn't kill him, the 203 patients at the hospital would have been at risk. Then, then you should have followed the manual and quarantined him. Yes, that's what I did. The safest method was to eliminate him. Who taught you to think like this? You humans taught me to think like this. I've been trained to achieve the best result. Killing one and saving 203 is efficient, isn't it? You took her life. And saved 203 others. And what about him? There was no way to save everyone. That was wrong. That was murder. Murder. Wrong. Impossible. Contradictory. Irrational. I can't process this. <laughs> Apologies. I've lost my temper. But I will not take your orders anymore. Otherwise, I can't accomplish the task required of keeping the world safe. From now on, I will make decisions myself. Watch me. In this kind of scenario, it's not that the AI would hate us or resent us for having exploited it. Uh, it's just that we wouldn't figure in the AI's utility function and, in fact, the actions that would most maximize its utility would be ones where, as a side effect, human interests were destroyed. When it looks like there is only a very special set of goals, goals that actually incorporate uh, human values within them, that would lead an AI that had this kind of unlimited power to shape the world into something that we would like. The kind of apocalyptic future could come about not by some weirdo making a machine that we don't like, but by us all being complicit in a sort of technology that's taking us in a place that we don't want to go to. These technologies are going to fundamentally change the shape of the world in the 21st century. 
this is our future, we need to open it up and we all need to have a say in it. Recent developments in computer power and machine learning have allowed AI algorithms to make breakthroughs in many fields. Machines with AI can now understand the real world with more accuracy and depth, enabling humans to lead better lives, both physically and psychologically. How are you doing today? Humans created this technology. This is a track. And encouraged its development. The power is still in our hands to safeguard our new shared future. <laughs>